So um, this panel is not about regulations, it's about operations, which is uh, even closer to my heart. I used to be um, an operator. Uh, my name is Lars, Christian Grudemolson, says up there. Um, I used to be an op operator of shared micromobility. Now I'm a consultant, thank you. Uh, just helping bridge the gap between public and private. Um, and I just really want to give some context on what we're discussing before I introduce these lovely people. Um, because there are a lot of different perspectives of what uh, operational excellence for micromobility, shared micromobility, that is, is. But uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there's really just one that matters. And it's delivering a great, sustainable, profitable, safe offering to clients in cities. If customers experience rides that feel safe, comfortable, available, and most importantly, not annoying, they will prefer this operator. If they find the, the ride annoying or not safe or any of the other things, they'll likely choose someone else. Um, so that is customer value. And this panel represents what drives that customer value. And I just really want to kind of take you behind the curtains and show you what these tasks are and what the things they enable is. So, I mean, for um, shared e-scooters, shared e-bikes to work, you have basically operational personnel swapping batteries, moving vehicles to where we need them as customers. Uh, we have these operational people testing the vehicles to make sure that they're safe, and if they aren't safe to ride, if they're broken, they take them back to the warehouse where a repair team is ready to fix them. Um, they are administrated, the, the warehouse is managed, um, and you have an operational vehicle fleet that is administrated and maintained by operations managers. And also on the back office, you have things like customer service, handling issues with the payment, your app, the vehicle, or even insurance claims if something goes wrong. You have bid managers bidding on tenders, you have accountants doing bookkeeping, and then you have the managers that administrate the organization. And behind all of this is the supplier ecosystem that I know many of you are a part of and are familiar with, with vehicles, insurers, technology, et cetera, that ensure that the operators keep their focus laser sharp and on what they need to be good at. So, and that's where this uh, panel comes in to, to really show us and to discuss where we're moving to and where we are right now. So. Uh, can you just please introduce yourself, say your role, and what you do to enable shared micromobility operations? Tobias, take it away. Right. Thank you, Lars. So my name is Tobias Balkin. Uh, I'm the CEO of Ride Technology. We are a Nordic e-scooter operator, soon also to be an e-bike operator. We manage a fleet of roughly 30,000 own vehicles. Um, so we like to say we are uh, the smallest of the large European-based operators. Uh, and we're also unique in the sense that we're actually truly profitable all the way down to net profit. Uh, so I think we have a lot to bring to the table in, in the discussion of operational excellence, which is obviously close to our heart. Alina. Hi, my name is Alina Stefan. I'm a business advisor for e-mobility rentals, uh, who's doing end-to-end -end, um, operational excellency in, uh, in the uh, rental area. Uh, we have uh, both scooters and cars available. And uh, we're still a startup, so uh, right now we have uh, about 100 uh, vehicles on the road, but uh, 400 by the end of this, this year. Uh, we're gr growing rapidly. We're, like I mentioned, we're fully operational, so uh, we have a chance to uh, improve as we go. And I'm delighted to be among uh, these wonderful people at this panel and uh, talk about uh, operational excellency and the challenges of it. My name is Kalle. I'm a co-founder at Cache. Cache is a insurance technology company and uh, building both of the sites. So with uh, insurers, we are building uh, insurance solutions for micromobility companies to enable the business, and we build tech to uh, to to run the operations. So we do 
we do claims management, we do, we do fleet handling, we do analytics behind um, uh, the, uh, the fleet operations. And we also provide them a rental portal because uh, because I mean, in this uh, in this new new forms of uh, new forms of uh, operations, uh, as as many additional services we can provide for the for the companies, the easier the life we do, and then that's our our uh, our role in in this ecosystem to save uh, those. Those people's time and money who uh, who actually have to be on the streets and and operate and not spend time on, I mean, thinking how to file a claim, how to build the insurance contract that uh, that makes sense for the for the customer and also for the fleet owner, and as well as run uh, run rentals if if we talk about let's say micro mobility business for couriers for example. Good, Irina. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Irina. Um, I work for Tier Mobility. We're one of the global uh, shared e-scooter and e-bike operators. We also have uh, some operations with mechanical bikes uh, and uh, yeah, presented across Europe, uh, I think Middle East and uh, United States of America. Uh, my background is in operational excellence and manufacturing. So when I joined the micro mobility industry about one and a half years ago, I first went into the operational excellence in tech, helping the product teams to build internal operation products to uh, support our operations teams in their daily operations. And uh, currently I work more on the consumer side on the parking and compliance topics, which are also closely related to the operational excellence and uh, the profitability topics. Joseph. Well, I'm Joseph, uh, I'm co-founder of Zoba. We're a fleet optimization company. So we partner with large shared mobility operators uh, to kind of power a lot of the backend operational logic. So vehicle pickups, drop-offs, battery swaps, routing, things like that. Uh, we operate globally in about 250 to 300 cities at any given point, uh, covering hundreds of thousands of vehicles. So have pretty broad exposure to uh, all regions where folks are operating. Cool. Yeah, let's dive straight into it. Because, uh, I mean, one of the themes that I really want to get at, which is, I mean, important for all startups and especially the operators, is profitability. And that's where you said uh, to be us initially that you guys have something to offer because uh, a lot of the operators still don't have profitable operations down to the earnings level, but you do. Mm. So like earnings after tax, after interest, it's in the Norwegian like account. You can even, I can send you the link. So we know that it's true. Just so the numbers like, are public. Yeah, the numbers are public, so it's not like a press release or anything. Um, I hope I don't offend anyone with kind of <laughs> making that precision because I'm kind of implying something else. But yeah, go. Uh, obviously, if I had the magic sauce, I would be willing to sell it for a large sum of some money. <laughs> some operators need some help there. But it's obviously complicated. It's many factors. It's not like one silver bullet, obviously. Um, but also the startup ride, I think, is important here because we were started quite differently than many of our peers, which were venture capital funded, and they prioritized one thing, which was growth. And that was their sort of mandate from their boards and their investors. So obviously they just followed their sort of uh, the goals that they had. We, to a large extent, were bootstrapped. So we sort of from day one had to build a model that was scalable, uh, also in the sense of financial sustainability. And then you had to solve sort of many factors to ensure that you had that uh, financial viability and had that run rate because we hadn't uh, billions to burn in cash. Mm. Um, so that means that we have had some different priorities in our growth. We have mm. grown more sort of brick by brick, adding a few cities every year, even though mm. we have grown like 10,000 scooters annually last three years. So it wow. is sort of an impressive growth there, but some of our peers have grown significantly mm. quicker. Mm. Um, and then we are also uh, doing all the operations in-house. Uh, mm. So I think that is the key, key component. You mentioned mm. this operational excellence. What is it? And for us, it's sort of a consistent, high quality customer experience at a cost-efficient way. Yeah. That's really, the, and that's a trade-off, right? With yeah. cost-efficiency and a good customer experience. Mm. But why is it so hard to master like profitable operations? I, I think it's back to some of the mandates that were given in some of the early days from the industry. Uh, also in the sense that some of them have, uh, without any offense, built large headquarters, which is costly to run, and sort of built a large organization for them to be profitable later on once you have the scale. Mm. And that has proven uh, difficult, uh, I think, mm. for many. Uh, we have a much leaner headquarters, to put mm. it mildly. Uh, the bid team, you're looking at it. Uh, <laughs> so it's sort of, we run a very lean ship. Yeah. Uh, and that influences everything we do uh, throughout the organization. Yeah. 
also spending lots of effort making sure our assets, that is the scooters, last for a really long time and have a high fleet utilization. Mm. Irina, how does uh, tier work towards uh, profitability? I think, you know, I've seen different companies in different industries working towards profitability. And in the end, it really all comes down to like the very kind of maybe basic things. And I would say this is around like focus, prioritization and global organization wide alignment. Because when we speak about focus, and that's what Tobias, uh, Tobias also mentioned earlier, is that when you're a VC backed company focusing on a global, global growth, it doesn't matter if you are in, in micro mobility or you're in fintech or somewhere else. We saw all of these companies mm. kind of not achieving profitability in the past few years because the money were easily available and because through that growth you could take more risks you can try more innovation and it was kind of inherent to the process that doesn't mean we didn't pay attention to ops it's just that when you're a global operator you need time to build up the knowledge and the data and the tools to make sure that you can sustainably operate across the market and that's mm. also what we have been doing in these years and we kind of it in a way, it nicely came together that mm. over the course of the years, you mature, you get all this knowledge, all this data, you build out the tools. And then when your ability to grow by putting the vehicles on the map is cut off, mm. you just refocus yourself into the, um, into the things that are already partially there, make yourself uh, put more emphasis on the profitability mm. and uh, yeah, focus on this mm. more than before. Yeah, and, and I mean, it makes perfect sense because like if you your investors say to you, you have to grow in this speed at this, uh, this pace, then to get this kind of revenue, then you just throw cash on the problem to kind of get that hockey stick. Um, and I mean, I was there, I was putting out uh, these uh, shitty nine bot ES4s on the streets, seeing them break, seeing okay, this is probably not going to be profitable in the long term, but it's come a long way. And I, Irina, I really just want to hear, hear from you on one more thing before we kind of tap into the supplier ecosystem here. Um, because you've now been building uh, tech products for warehouse operations. Um, and I really want to know more about like which results have you seen kind of in, in making that process more streamlined and, and more efficient? Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to in warehouse operations or overall operational excellence product, uh, I have a bit of like a professional deformity in that way uh, because I to, I see two kinds of positive results, right? One thing is obviously the streamlining, as you say, and the kind of visible uh, operational improvements and efficiency improvements. And honestly, it is relatively simple because most of the time at the very basic of it, it goes from putting things that are in people's head into a digital form so that you can onboard people easily like if you're launching a new vehicle you don't need to distribute things you know you have everything mm. digitalized in the app if you need people to do a repair they don't have to come up with the ways to do it what tools do they use they have the information in the app and you see that in any kind of metric you would see so the speed of onboarding the number of repairs per hour the kind of time that the vehicles spend on the street versus coming back to the warehouse mm, mm. and the second bit about it is kind of making problems visible which is where i say i have this professional uh thing where i kind of like it <laughs> in a way if we break things which is not a very good thing to say about uh, for a product person but in the ops if you realize for example that you have done certain repairs and the vehicle keeps coming back to the warehouse, then probably there is something with our standard operating procedure, maybe we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And by making it visible with tech, we can actually address it. So mm -hmm. to me, this is also kind of a benefit of having tech enabled operations, even if in the moment you can have a frustrating experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really cool. And, and I, I, I want us to get back to the product bit. I just really want us to kind of like tap into the, like a bit of the value prop in the supplier ecosystem that's sitting here on uh, on the three remaining chairs. Um, Kalle, um, as an operator, I know that the insurance premium, it's, a, it's quite, especially for a regulated market like Norway, which I was in, it's, a, it's quite a substantial line item. And I think uh, Tobias can confirm this. Of course. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> and by, by that, it means it's a significant cost. Um, so how do you um, work to help kind of operators reduce that cost? In, uh, in many ways. So uh, first of all, 
all these companies have uh, quite a lot of data in their hands, uh, which I would say has not been used by, by the insurance companies too often. So the behavioral data definitely helps to avoid um, bad drivers uh, or bad riders uh, uh, coming to the coming to use the, 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 the vehicles again at some point. I mean, many operators have already launched the reckless driver uh, programs. Uh, we are trying to find a way how to, how to make it cross-platform so that, I mean, mm. if, I, if I'm reckless at one platform, so I, I mm. would not have the access to the, to the another one uh, at all. So that's one point. The, uh, and, and once you make it, let's say, more data-driven, the insurance product as such, mm. then, uh, then, uh, then, then it's just, I mean, uh, more efficient from unit economics perspective as well. Because, I mean, there, is, there are two ways. So, so the insurance premium can be flat rate fixed, I mean, cost for you, mm. or, uh, or it's designed Based on the based on the unit economics, so mm. if the operator earns, so they pay for the premium as well, which mm. is lower because of the data that we use, uh, and and also from the unit economics perspective. So this is one thing. Yeah. The other thing is, I mean, the team. I would say that uh, that uh, that these people who understand tech and insurance at the same time. So mm. it's it's a rare occasion. So mm. uh, so definitely, insurtechs mm. have them have them, and and we have the competence in house, so we can actually supply the. The, the the companies uh, to with the, with the knowledge and they don't have to mm. hire internal teams yeah. which is a big cost and sure. uh, and maybe maybe the last thing uh, to uh, to uh, to to mention here is that I mean Tier definitely is one of the top players I mean in terms of the size of the fleet in 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 the market but there are lots of small and medium sized fleets as well as we see here so so it's different in terms of insurers acting with them. Uh, and also in terms of competence that can mm. be bought in-house. And what we have decided is that, I mean, Tier, Bolt, uh, Bird, they have, and Voy, they have their own solutions insurance teams. And we, we are focusing more on the small and medium-sized fleets to, to actually mm. provide them the competence that mm. uh, they are sometimes lacking of, mm. and then bundle together um, insurance policies from, yeah. from different companies. Just, I mean, I think I'm not alone in saying that insurance is extremely difficult to understand here. So I have an example. And so bear with me here. So if I wasn't uh, a personal Christian and I went on a binge one Saturday night on a scooter, completely drunk, and would you then like, because I'm just trying to tap into the kind of like, how do you identify the with the trip data? Um, that I'm a reckless driver, you know? Like, do you actually go in and, and see the telemetry data and see like my, my driving like this and then kind of say, okay, Lars, he's a bad driver? Is that kind of how it works? Like in terms of the technical aspect of the data, like how you look? Well, kind of, because yeah. there, are, there are several uh, tech providers nowadays who have this ability with whom we we work together, so this this kind of tech we don't have ourselves, but we use this data that uh, that the providers uh, have. So yeah, I would say that all these things yeah. are predictable. Cool. And 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 just to, to kind of finish that. So if then I would go from from uh, Rye, then if they were a customer of you, uh, to another customer of you, then I wouldn't be able to kind of take a ride with that provider. Otherwise, if they would be. That's the thing that we are working on. It's not not there yet, so we are trying to find the solution for that, but. It would probably help to solve many of the questions, also yeah. the regulatory aspects, because mm. this is one thing why cities are are mad mad of yeah. um, the, the the users. Mm. Quick, uh, just quickly want to add. You said it was difficult uh, to understand uh, insurance, mm. but I think it's very difficult for insurance companies to understand micro mobility as well. Yeah, yeah. And we had a major problem when the insurance uh, requirements came in Norway to really have the traditional insurance company understand the risk, understand what we're actually doing. Uh, because a lot of the data that you mentioned and that Carl mentions is there. We have that data. I'm sure Tier has the same. Uh, but to get them to understand it was yeah, yeah. very I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, Alina, you provide uh, a lot of different kinds of vehicles on a... Is it, it's a day rental scheme or like a monthly rental scheme, isn't it? It's a monthly uh, rental scheme. Um, and two shared micromobility operators as well, then, I assume. Yes, the way it works, uh, so we have uh, two types of scooters and three types of cars that uh, can be rented. And uh, it's a 
flexible program, so you can swap in between a scooter and a car. Um, also, being in Eastern Europe, uh, the weather conditions change, as is pretty much all over Europe. So you may want to have a scooter during summer, but uh, a car during the winter. Um, and we uh, in, enable them as a full service to mostly B2B customers. Um, so we are a B2B2C solution. Mm. Uh, most of our customers are in uh, either courier or delivery services mm. um, and for them or retail if retail wants to change the fleet the conventional fl uh, fleet for an alternative fleet mm. and nowadays uh, since we have such strong ESG requirements and pressures both from investors and from uh, regulators companies do need to address the the e part of the ESG so we're a perfect solution for them um, because not only do they become efficient in terms of time and money, mm. but it's also in terms of people on teams mm. that will actually take care, care of those fleets. And the way it works, uh, they pay a monthly subscription, mm. as uh, you asked me prior. And with that, they have a full service, full service meaning um, access to the vehicles, being them uh, scooters or cars, uh, maintenance, um, uh, servicing. Um, in case of mm. any need, uh, they have a replacement car. They have um, a battery access, so mm. they can swap the batteries uh, from those swap stations that we have available, mm. free of cost. So that's also mm. very easy and, and simple for them to do. Um, and for the company, it's no hassle. It's one-stop shop, uh, a solution with no hassle on their end. And for the user, for the actual driver, we provide not only education and training and safety measure, mm -hmm. but we also, um, they become, uh, at least the ones that we board, they're very happy because mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a nice new uh, vehicle. Yeah, I can um, imagine, just, uh, just to jump in, I mean, because I assume like Tobias, you would be, if you had this in Norway, and you knew that you could get like, instead of taking uh, 15 minutes between a task downtown Oslo, you could uh, take uh, five minutes between sure. tasks. And like with a lot of these small operational vehicles, you don't have to worry that they're breaking down because a lot of them are so new. Then you can just hand them over to Alina again <laughs> and then she'll take care of the repairs. I mean, I, I assume that must be a dream for you. Yeah, it's back to the sort of definition of operational excellence, right? What, how do we deliver in an efficient way? And if this sort of helps us to be efficient, great, of course. Mm. Segue to, to, to Joseph, because you are kind of helping with creating profitable rebalancing. Can you just explain how that works? Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> the way to think about what we're doing is we are trying to understand how the market's going to evolve in the future. So if you think about like a operations team that's planning their day, we want to know where is demand going to be um, on this specific day in this weather and so on, but also how is supply going to evolve? Uh, where is there going to be competition factors like that? The operator passes us uh, what kind of tasks they need. So they say, hey, we're doing you know X battery swaps and Y rebalances. Uh, we have three vans, here's the capacity, and here are some constraints we have, regulatory constraints, whatever they might be. Um, and then on our side, we process that and pass back those recommendations. Um, we do this all typically programmatically, so we're integrated with the kind of existing operation stack. So Zoba's not, uh, if you think about it, we're not a sort of full service application layer suite. We are a sort of decisions as a service company. Um, which is nice in that it allows us to integrate uh, with tools that folks want to build and I think enables us to uh, go up market a bit in terms of larger operators who want to own many of the actual services people are looking at. Cool. Um, and, and there's something really interesting about Zoba um, that you mentioned because, I mean, a lot of uh, operators want to have this yeah. in-house. Yeah. Uh, but you're kind of the outsource alternative. Yeah. Like, how do you treat that or? Yeah, and we're probably, I think, a little bit unique as an, uh, an external party in that we do mostly work with larger operators, which you often see is that uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the different partners, like you had mentioned, are working more with kind of small and medium-sized folks. 
because uh, they don't want to build certain functions. What we found, and we've kind of grown up with this space. So we we started the company um, in 2016. Uh, so in micro mobility years, that feels like <laughs> a decade or longer. Um, I guess it's actually coming up on a decade now, which is funny. Uh, but we've seen different kind of seasons. I think as uh, capital has kind of come and gone into the space. I think in the early days, uh, as companies were theorizing around what a moat could be in shared micro, this was one of the early things people thought of. Um, I think that that has not largely come to pass in the space in terms of that being a core moat, um, or candidly, um, much becoming a core moat. Like regulatory seems to be a bigger and bigger moat. Um, parts of operational efficiency, if you can run profitably, continue to fund the business. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, all these companies have a sort of portfolio of things they're building or going external for, right? At all times, mm -hmm. they're evaluating this. Uh, what we found is that in the early days, there was enough complexity that people would come to Zoba because they thought, hey, I'm building something, but I also need something that works today. And what you have today is probably more battle tested. You've seen more markets. You've seen more regulatory frameworks um, because we codify those into the, into the system. Uh, so we need something to help now. What, but we are going to eventually build this long term. I think you still hear that, uh, but what we see increasingly is uh, the capital kind of flight from micro that we're all very aware of, uh, I think has sobered up the space quite a bit and people are now being much more output oriented. So they're saying like, look, um, maybe we would prefer to have something internal, but one of the benefits we have as a business is that you can test what we do empirically. So you can essentially run A-B test system A being the legacy system, system B being Zoba, run them together at scale in a large way, in a way that's mm. blind to agents and mm. can give you really um, nice data. And if that shows you that it's going to move you meaningfully closer to profitability, I think that is the sort of thing that reigns today. And mm. that's something that we can not only consistently provide, but when we start to see a lot of this kind of belt tightening, we're actually now, uh, guaranteeing contractually. So mm -hmm. if that outperformance ever mm -hmm. lacks, then there's no fees or rebated yeah. fees. Cool. And uh, Tobias, you've chosen to produce your own app, your own customer mm -hmm. app, mm -hmm. and your own IoT, and I assume your own kind of like a backend uh, operational software. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and not outsource. No. Why? I think it's back to the things that we do all the operations in-house, the battery swapping and the maintenance. And for us, having that direct dialogue between the in-house, in particular mechanics, and the uh, IT tech team is really important because it means a lot of efficiencies between them, as also was mentioned here, in terms of, okay, if we put the shrinkage tube on this wire, what happens with the scooters in 10 days? Is it still on the street or is it back in the warehouse for the mm. same repair? And you can do a lot of that development uh, quickly. Mm. And the same goes for the operations team. And, and we try to do some of the things that Soba uh, does as well. I'm sure we're not that advanced and we're having a good dialogue now on how we can look at things. Uh, so it's really interesting what we have, but it's back to uh, show us the money. Uh, yeah. That's the critical thing here, right? That yeah. this actually works and gives an uplift in, uh, in the ridership or a mm. decrease in cost. And uh, how do you evaluate that? Like what to insource and how to, what to outsource? It comes down to the competence, right? We want to be the best scooter operator around mm. and have a strong customer experience. Uh, and whatever sort of influences the customer experience, we want to do internally. So, for example, the app, again, strong influence, obviously, on the, on the customer experience. Uh, the same goes for the uh, maintenance and the quality experience of the scooter. It needs to feel safe, needs to feel uh, robust, clean, all these elements. And that's mm. why we sort of want to insource to have full control of the product that we offer to our mm. customers. Irina, you've uh, you're an insourcer. <laughs> Are you reevaluating now, in general? Well, I would say that uh, it's different with the context that the company is in, because if we take a look at the big operators, I know 2019 against today, and then a smaller operator, I think there are three very different situations, right? And uh, let's say back in the day. Uh, when the money and the capital were, uh, was more available, so it was a potential competitive edge to try and develop many tools internally. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of benefits to having internal tools because you can streamline for your vehicles, for your processes, you can scale them globally. Uh, and when you have the resources, it's interesting to try and innovate because if you go for an external provider, 
uh, with other, along with other operators, then you have a kind of a unified solution. But mm -hmm. if you're trying to build it internally, then you have this potential for a competitive edge if you're like really getting it to a good level. And that's some of the things we did. So we would try to build an internal solution and take a look at the outsourcing solution and compare them in the key metrics and see, do we want to go for external one or for uh, our in-house one? But I think now that the capital is more scarce, independently of the size of the operator, if you come up with a new problem or you hit new space and developing an internal tool will take time and money and we don't necessarily have that anymore the way we did a few years back. Mm. And if there is a solution on market like Zoba, which already proved to be very efficient and specific problem spaces, why not go for it? Mm, mm, mm. Very interesting. Yeah, because I think it, what's what's a bit interesting to see is like what is actually instrumental to to winning a space, winning a city. Um, and I just wanted to kind of segue a bit more into what you said a bit earlier in, in one of our conversations, Tobias, because you said that um, operations is a part, key part of why you win a city. Because mm. uh, you have a first spot in a lot of the cities. I mean, how many of the cities are you? Uh, three this year in Norway. That were ranked first for right. Three. Yeah. yeah. Including Oslo, which is one of the uh, most profitable cities in the world, I think, cool. for Microsoft. Yeah. So that was good. Wow, congrats. And, but why, in terms of operations, why? I think we had the discussion which you hosted just now with Paris, London, and, and Bergen, right? And that's also on the operators' round. There was lots of promises. So the operators promised everything, and a lot of it was based on tech. So the municipalities, I think, has been disappointed uh, again and again, and that's led to some of the regulatory backlash that we've seen. So for us, we've sort of always been, yes, tech is really important to deliver, but at the end of the day, if you have a scooter which is wrongly parked or it's toppled over, it's not going to upright itself. You need actually someone out there in operations to fix that issue. Uh, and that's why we're really keen on having people on the street doing that sort of manual part of the job, which is really critical to offer a good service both to our customers, but of course to the cities. Mm. Uh, so that's why we spend a lot of effort also building the operationals team and, and the tasks that they do, mm. the way we develop our own app to make mm. sure that we get quickly notified when there's wrongly parked scooters, and we can actually act upon it. Mm. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, we're nearing the end, so I just wanted to kind of um, end this panel by asking each of you uh, to ask to answer this question with one sentence, uh, if you can discipline yourselves. <laughs> um, so what's the biggest opportunity in terms of operations and profitability that you see today? Tobias, you can start. Continued growth, continued growth in existing markets to have a larger market penetration. I think uh, you see so, so more rights per city. More rights, more rights per city. Mm. Alina, I think uh, for us is creating value, being obsessed about creating value and turning the story, not not putting the light on us, but uh, putting the light in our case for our customers. See how many problems we can solve for them and how much value we can create for them. I think that will be a recipe for success cool. in the long run. Kala. Customer satisfaction, uh, both in terms of the operational setup and, and also if something happens and they feel secure, so the insurance contract is there and it's easy, it's understandable, and the claim is paid in hours, not in weeks. Irina? Yeah, I think I second everybody by saying that it's sustainable, you know, operations. When it both comes to the customer satisfaction, but also to the regulation and to, every, to the cost side that comes with it. Finally. I think there is still a lot of untapped potential in terms of uh, running better operations. We sometimes see as high as like a 50% wasted deployment rate um, by an operator. So half the, I'm using punctuation here, that was a parenthesis, uh, but like half of the deployments being, you know, not, not creating a single incremental ride. So I don't know that that's enough to make operators profitable long-term. It'll have to be in conjunction with other things. But uh, for Zoba's position, it's finding a way to run the operations more efficiently day in and day out. Thank you guys for taking the time to join this panel. Uh, in the back room, I have a Norwegian chocolate for each of you. So uh, yeah, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.